M drive is a new class of electrical machine. It's one which directly converts electrical energy into thrust, uh, but does not need reaction mass. Um, so it's, um, it's like a rocket engine, but without the exhaust plume. Um, at its heart, there is a microwave cavity, a resonant microwave cavity, and the special shape of this cavity enables the momentum in the electromagnetic wave, which is propagating inside the, the cavity, to be transferred to the cavity itself. <clears throat> and therefore, you are changing electrical energy into kinetic energy. Well, <clears throat> it all started um, uh, way back in the depths of the Cold War, actually. <clears throat> um, there was considerable concern over the accuracy of the guidance systems of the um, strategic missiles that were um, being deployed at that time. And um, it was um, of such concern that a, a small group uh, of R&D engineers was, was put together. I, I was part of this group. And we were actually told to think the unthinkable, uh, to try and come up with solutions to this problem. And it was during that um, uh, absolutely brilliant exercise that, that, um, uh, that, that I actually um, uh, got my early ideas for, for M-Drive. Um, <clears throat> the, the solution wasn't M-Drive, and, and I went off and did um, uh, some quite interesting things for, uh, for the British Army after that. Um, but in 1980, I, I um, it was in the, the middle of the desert uh, when the Iran-Iraq war broke out, and it was all very alarming. And so when I got back to the UK, I decided I, I, I'd better find a, a new career path. Um, and I joined the space industry. <clears throat> and it was while I was working on the, um, the design of the Skynet um, 4 uh, communication satellite um, that it dawned on me that um, what I'd been working on previously, some years before, uh, would be ideal for propelling satellites, um, particularly m military satellites in, that ca in this case. So, so that was really where, where it all came from. <clears throat> oh, the the, the uh, eternal question. Um, no, M-Drive does not break Newton's laws. Um, in fact, <laughs> It works because of Newton's third law. Um, uh, M-drive produces thrust in one direction, um, and if it's uh, allowed to, it will accelerate in the opposite direction. Um, uh, momentum is conserved by this process, um, and, um, uh, and, and that's what Newton's third law is looking for. <coughs> uh, in fact, M-drive is based purely on classic physics, um, the, the physics of, of, of Maxwell, um, Newton, and Einstein. There is really no need to bring in exotic physics to explain M-drive. Um, we don't need quantum vacuum plasma effects, and it is most certainly not a warp drive. <clears throat> No, it is not reactionless. Um, it is propellantless or propellant-free, perhaps. Um, but uh, in real life, there's no such thing as a reactionless drive. Um, you know, Newton doesn't allow for it, and I don't attempt to build one. Well, the main players um, are still in the UK. China and the US. <clears throat> However, um, there are three other countries that have um, serious uh, programs running that I know of. And there are also um, a growing number of um, university departments and private individuals who um, uh, are trying to replicate our first uh, experiments. This is of concern because um, an M drive 
is a potentially lethal device, um, particularly if you are close to measuring um, reasonable amounts of thrust. It means you have a very high Q cavity. <clears throat> you uh, are putting in a significant amount of input power, um, and uh, uh, this makes it quite dangerous. So the way to handle the device is the way that um, uh, you know, I, I learned in my, my early career as a defense contractor, you must um, uh, devise uh, rigorous, strict, and knowledgeable safety procedures before you start experimenting with M-Drive. Uh, it is, uh, has the potential to kill you, uh, and, and, and you must obviously bear this in mind. It's great fun. Um, uh, and, and it's very tempting just to, to rush in and, and test it, but um, you must consider the safety aspects before you do this. Second generation M drive, <coughs> which is the superconducting version of M drive, will give us eventually low cost access to space. Um, now, this will make, uh, <coughs> make solar power satellites economical. Um, they will, in fact, be far cheaper and considerably more safer than nuclear power stations, for instance. Um, so um, what at present is, is really not economically viable will become the obvious um, source of clean um, uh, green electrical energy. Now, <clears throat> the space planes that will be developed um, and used as launch vehicles um, uh, for this low-cost access to space can also <clears throat> be used, uh, can be developed into long-haul aircraft. Um, they will give vertical takeoff and landing, so you don't need runways anymore. You'll get city to center to city center flights. Uh, they'll be quiet green, and importantly, the, the, the airframes for these uh, aircraft or space planes will be uh, essentially uh, low-stressed uh, airframes. What we're proposing uh, is that we use liquid hydrogen to um, actually cool the superconducting um, cavities, um, and then the hydrogen gas which boils off from this cooling process is used in fuel cells to provide the electrical energy into the, um, <coughs> uh, into the M drive engine itself. So while you're going through the atmosphere, um, you, you're simply using uh, liquid hydrogen fuel as fuel. Uh, once you get out of the atmosphere, you'll need a small amount of liquid oxygen as well. Um, but the end product of, um, uh, uh, of the process is, is simply water. So, um, okay, we'll get a few more vapor trials, um, but, but um, it's clean and green. Well, what we're proposing in our development program is that um, we start off with um, small-scale UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and these will be used to <coughs> as part of the development process. But clearly, once, um, uh, once we have these flying, the next step would be simply to scale them up to small personal air vehicles. Um, so possibly one of the first um, uh, wide-scale applications that we may see are, are the, um, the longed-for flying cars. So, uh, so perhaps there, there is a solution to the city traffic jams. Well, I, I think um, uh, in, there's been an interesting study done in Europe as to, as to what, how you would actually incorporate um, a, a flying uh, a personal air vehicle into society. And, and the thinking is that it will almost certainly be an autopilot. Um, you, you won't fly these yourself, and you won't own them. I, I, I'm sure you'll simply um, <coughs> uh, ring up for a, a, a vehicle to take you from A to B. It will arrive, land outside your uh, home or office, um, and will automatically take you to wherever you want to go. 
um, uh, this seems to be a, a rather more sensible way of, um, of incorporating these vehicles safely into, into the infrastructure, the traffic infrastructure. So um, I, I suspect, you know, in, in the long term, um, uh, the, the cars and, um, uh, and other vehicles that we have uh, today will become purely for leisure use and perhaps of historical interest only. Yes, um, we did, um, we have done a number of design studies um, and um, uh, one that I've reported on in, um, in previous conferences um, is the uh, uh, fairly large 300-ton um, <coughs> space plane um, uh, for delivering 50-ton uh, payloads into geostationary orbit. Um, now, these space planes operating on a regular basis um, will bring the costs or per kilogram of, of um, payload to geostationary orbit uh, down by a factor of 130 compared to ex the existing launch vehicles. Um, now, this is a, a huge cost saving. Um, it's um, uh, better than 10 times the cost saving that has been uh, thought necessary to make um, solar power satellites viable, for instance. Um, so um, uh, you will have then the ability to put large <coughs> um, payloads, 50 tonnes a time, into, uh, into orbit. Uh, you, and therefore, if you can put um, uh, solar power satellites into orbit, you can also put solar uh, sunshades into orbit. Um, the, the other um, important thing to, to, to note is that these sunshades will be totally controllable because um, uh, first generation um, M drive, which will be used for in orbit applications, um, uh, will give you total control over the, um, uh, the angle of these um, uh, sun shields and, and therefore you will be able to control them on a, a basically a minute by minute basis um, uh, uh, to, um, to give you the exact amount of thermal control that you need. Well, this is an, a particularly interesting aspect of, um, uh, uh, of the type of vehicles that we're proposing uh, will use M-Drive technology. Uh, essentially, they um, <coughs> are vehicles, they're called space planes. They operate both in the atmosphere and um, above the atmosphere in space. Uh, and the thing about them is that um, uh, their flight envelope is such that they um, uh, don't go fast inside the atmosphere and they don't accelerate very fast. Um, so the uh, stresses, the thermal and mechanical stresses that we see in, in current aircraft um, will be very much reduced. Um, uh, and you, because in effect you only go fast when you're in vacuum, um, uh, it makes it uh, clearly a lot more efficient way of flying. Uh, but it also, as I say, um, means that the um, airframe can be built using a much more low technology. In fact, it's very um, <coughs> suitable for the sort of technology that is currently used in the car industry. Um, and therefore, um, uh, we can envisage um, uh, high volume production of um, these launch vehicles uh, using low cost technology. Uh, some of it is already being developed by the, the automobile industry. I mean, the, the obvious um, example is um, hydrogen fuel, fuel cells. I mean, that, that's, that's um, uh, well into development now for cars and will uh, apply directly to, um, to space planes. So um, uh, I, I don't believe that it's a cost factor that is going to hold up... Um, uh, the development and application of, of uh, M-Drive. Clearly, the <coughs> existing infrastructure and the large industrial vested interests that, um, uh, that produce this infrastructure um, are going to uh, wish to 
slow down or even suppress um, such new technology. Now, th this is not a new problem. Any disruptive technology has this problem. Um, uh, however, the, um, you know, the, the, the world's problems are getting so serious that, um, uh, uh, that the politicians uh, uh, and the industrialists should start to take note of this. Uh, and I'm sure if they don't in the West, then we will find the developing countries that don't have this uh, inbuilt um, uh, <coughs> set of vested interests will, will simply take over the technology, uh, develop it using, as I say, uh, fairly low-cost manufacturing uh, techniques and, um, uh, and, and will simply solve the problem for us. So, um, so there's a challenge there. It's, it's, um, it's rather more a political challenge than a, a technical challenge, I would say. Okay, well, in 50 years' time, um, I believe that um, M-Drive will help us to dramatically reduce our dependence on fo fossil fuels. Uh, this in itself will, will, will help with the climate control um, or, or reducing the, the um, rise of, um, of temperature of, of our world. Uh, I, I also believe that, that the sun shields will come into play to, to, count, to finally counteract the, um, uh, <coughs> the, the, the climate change, temperature change. So, so I think we will have um, cracked those particular problems. Uh, I think we will have um, a much more um, user-friendly transport arrangement. Um, uh, everybody wants to get rid of traffic jams, and, um, uh, and it is a nonsense.